Hi everyone, thank you for coming. I realize it's dinner time and in the midst of Shabbat, so we're grateful that you could all be here. If at any point you need to leave, there are exits to the sides up front and in the Hi back. Um, and if at any I point you need a snack, there is a bake sale outside, Shabbat, so, uh, <laughs> so you can get some of here. those at the end. Um, and point, if at any point uh, you, you want to check out, uh, check in on your in children, the uh, they're um, upstairs in the community point, room, you so you can exit in the back side, and go up uh, the stairs to the left. Um, so this um, event has been point, uh, uh, truly a long time out, in the making. Uh, as soon as our children, new legislators uh, were elected, student room, groups so began working to ensure our community would have an opportunity to get to know our legislators and what work they hope to accomplish this session. This session. But of course, the work isn't all about them. It's about us. So I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about each of the groups that made this event possible. The Northampton High School Democrats always seek to engage our high school community and the greater Northampton community in civic actions ranging so from like holding in-class voter registration drives to event. canvassing and phone making for candidates to writing postcards for Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. <laughs> the Northampton High School Environmental Club held a vegetarian week in Water Bottle Week to inform high schoolers about ways to reduce waste, created a reusable water bottle lending library, and replaced styrofoam trays with plastic trays and reusable utensils in the cafeteria. The Northampton High School Feminist Collective co-hosted a screening of Girl Rising and held a pad and diaper drive for safe passage. The Northampton High School Gender Sexuality Alliance is the yearly host of Pride Week leading up to the Northampton High School Pride, or Northampton High, Northampton Pride Parade, too many Northampton high schools, uh, and work to pass question three. Uh, the Northampton High School Students of Color Alliance cooked Hispanic food to serve in the cafeteria for Hispanic Heritage Month, collaborated with the Northampton High School news broadcast, the transcript, to educate our school, school community on Northampton High School and held a screening of a film about children of immigrants. The Northampton High School Student Union established a, a new gender-neutral bathroom, made school cybersecurity information more public to students, established a Smith College textbook lending library, and are working to make se the sex ed curriculum more informative. <laughs> the Northampton Mayor's Youth Commission helped establish the community plastic bag ban and are working to get 16-year-olds the right to vote in Northampton municipal elections. The Pioneer Valley Students for Gun Control hosted numerous events to promote stricter gun control laws, including the 2018 Pioneer Valley March for Our Lives, uh, marched with the hashtag 50 miles more mass, and hosted a post-march workshop to bring student activist skills to continue their advocacy. <laughs> Last but not least, Youth Rise Together. They aim to get young people engaged in political advocacy and have worked to elect progressive candidates to the legislature. They are currently planning a fundraising event for the Pioneer Valley Workers Center. <laughs> On top of all of these fabulous youth groups, we must also thank our numerous additional co-sponsors. And there are over 20 of them. So it's gonna be a long list. Here we go. <laughs> Climate Action Now Massachusetts, Friends of Northampton Trails and Greenways, Indivisible Northampton, Mothers Out Front, Pioneer Valley, Northampton Community Television, Northampton Democratic City Committee, Northampton Education Foundation, Northampton High Speed Community Network Coalition, Northampton Human Rights Commission, Nuclear Band Us, uh, Pioneer Valley Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense, Pioneer Valley Resist Coalition, Pioneer Valley Women's March, Represent Western Mass, Smith Academy AP Government, the Sojourner Truth School for Social Change Leadership, the Resistance Center for Peace and Justice, UMass Democrats, Voter Choice Massachusetts, UMass Western Mass, uh, Animal Rights Advocates, Western Mass Medicare for All, and Two Degrees 
at greenneighbors.earth. I promise we're almost done with thank yous, but we have a few special ones. The first being our dear Kaylee and Kamini. We are so proud of how far your leadership skills have come this year, from being elected co-vice chairs of the Northampton High School Democrats, to organizing club meetings, to writing letters to the editor, to speaking at the Pioneer Valley Women's March. Your growth has uh, been leaps and bounds, and we could not be ha could not be more proud of how far you've come. As always, we must give a big, huge thank you to our AP US history teacher and club advisor, Mr. Mahar. <laughs> he always prints boundless amounts of paper and posters for us uh, and joined us on a Google document after school to make sure our questions tonight were perfect and tonight provided us with this wonderful podium. <laughs> Uh, and always make sure that our club events and events like these run smoothly. We could not do anything without you. Thank you, Mr. Mahar. <laughs> and our final shout out, of course, must go to NCTV and the techies for helping us smoothly run this event with setup, lights, and sound because we, of course, don't know how to do those things. Thank you, Ian and Sarah and Nick for helping us out with that. And now, on to the fun part, our legislators. If you didn't learn enough about them uh, during election season, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Uh, after graduating from Wellesley and the University of Edinburgh, Rep Sabados had traveled the world to enhance her experience as a linguist. Eventually, Lindsay found her way back to Western Mass, specifically Northampton, as the location for her translation business and to raise her daughter. In recent years, many of us has known her, have known her for her organizing work as the director of the Pioneer Valley uh, Women's March and devotion for activism <laughs> as a board member of both Emerge Massachusetts and the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Mass. However, we can now call, all call her a representative. Yesterday, she was appointed by House Speaker Robert DeLeo to serve as a member of the Committees on Transportation, Marijuana Policy, Steering, Policy and Scheduling, and Election Law. In the legislature, she is championing health care like no other. She is the lead sponsor uh, uh, of the House Medicare for All Bill and is pushing to expand reproductive freedom. Rep. Sabadosa is the first woman to be elected to serve the first Hampshire District Representative, uh, which is quite amazing. Uh, I also want to add a personal touch and say that beyond all the quite impressive things I just listed, Lindsay is a great mentor for me uh, these past few months, from working on her campaign to helping transition uh, into legislative mode, and we are incredibly grateful to have you as our representative. <laughs> now on to Joe. <laughs> Uh, Senator Comerford moved to Western Mass in the late 1990s after completing her degree in social work at Hunter College in New York. Jo quickly became involved in the community, uh, uh, serving for many years in leadership positions in various regional and national organizations, uh, uh, such as the American Friends Service Committee, the Food Bank of Western Mass, the National Priorities Project, project and most recently move on. Now as our state senator, she has just yesterday been appointed by Senate President Karen Spilka to serve as a Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Public Health, Senate Vice Chair of the Committee on Higher Education, and a member of the Committees on Revenue, Global Warming and Climate Change, Mental Health, Substance Use and Recovery, Post Audit and Oversight, and Marijuana Policy. Wow. <laughs> In the legislature, she is pursuing ways to make higher education more full affordable with her Cherish Act. Uh, she is also the first woman to serve as the uh, senator for the Hampshire, Franklin, and Worcester district. Yeah. 
She lives just a couple blocks away with her wife and two children. And now, without any further delays, we'll let the legislators introduce themselves and then get to the questions. So. I have been introduced a lot of times in the last year, and I have never gotten teary over an introduction, so. Um, Cheryl Lynn, like she mentioned, was an instrumental component of my campaign. Um, if you read the Gazette article the other day, I don't know if it included the fact, I hope it did, because I told them, that she texted me every day and said, what can I do? That's really special. And she's going to Brandeis. And not only is she going to Brandeis, but she has been awarded the Dr. Martin Luther King Fellowship, one of 10 students. And it's for people with amazing academic records, extracurricular performance, and who truly exemplify what it means to be a community member. So I know I'm supposed to be introducing myself, but can we all applaud her again? <laughs> so not only does Sherilyn text a lot, but she also tells me what to do frequently. And for this evening, she asked me to do two things. She asked me to talk about why state-level government is important, and she asked me to talk about my goals while in office. Small. And then she said, you have three minutes. Simplify what it means and to And I've already used 45 seconds. Why is state-level government important? I think she's already told you that tonight because she listed off organization after organization within this high school that works to impact state level policy. So these students already understand that their state government plays a huge role in their lives. From funding their school to deciding what, what college is gonna look like for them, how their public universities are gonna be funded, what, what the environment of the Commonwealth is gonna look like, what their healthcare is gonna look like. These are all things that are decided on the state level. And I am so thrilled that these students understand that. Because we live in a country sometimes where it feels like we don't pay as much attention to state level government. We pay a lot of attention to the craziness on the federal level. And we pay a lot of attention to our wonderful mayor who is here and our city councilors. But we don't always pay attention to the state level. And so when we talk about what my goals are, oh, we're going to change that. We're going to make sure that people pay attention. Because there is a lot of power in state government. So my number one goal, well, it's hard to number them, but the first one I'm going to talk to you about tonight is I want to make state-level government understandable. I want to make sure you know what is happening. And the State House and the House of Representatives, they, that can be hard to understand. It can be murky because we don't make it super open and clear for people how we do business. In fact, we have a D plus rating for transparency. It's not great. But we're gonna work to change that. And we're gonna work to change that because I'm gonna share with you how our government functions and you are gonna advocate. Because this is a partnership. I am elected to bring your voice to the State House and I am so honored to do that but we're gonna to have to work together to make our government more open and work better for you. So that's goal number one. <laughs> goal number two, of course, is what Cheryl Lynn alluded to, and that is Medicare for all. Now, luckily, we have this big presidential election coming up in two years, and all of the candidates are talking about healthcare. And that's exciting because it is creating momentum around a movement that we are going to need to create every single day in our communities. We're gonna need grassroots organizing to back this up. And I am so thrilled that this session, we have 40% more co-sponsors on the legislation than ever before. <laughs> and 
And the last thing, because they're telling me to wrap up, my last goal is I want to start having serious conversations about revenue. A lot of us filed great pieces of legislation, but we're going to have to talk about how we can afford to do things, and that means looking at revenue. And hopefully we can get into more details in the Q&A about that. So hint, ask questions about revenue. Thank you so much, and thank you for coming out tonight, and thank you again to all of the organizers. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to Cheryl Lynn. Thank you to the students. You know, I was talking to my wife, Anne, who surprised me by coming here, and we were talking around the dinner table tonight, and I said, this debate, the debate that the students of Northampton High School called us to at the beginning of the campaign, I felt set the bar for us, for this campaign that we did. They did it, right? They set the bar. They wanted meaningful conversation. They wanted hard questions. They wanted us to get on the record. And they wanted us to run for every single vote, to ask every voter to consider us as candidates. And it started here in Northampton High School. So it's really wonderful to be back. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm so delighted to be here. As Sherilyn said, I represent the Hampshire-Franklin Worcester District. Many of you know this, but just to be clear, Hampshire-Franklin Worcester is 24 cities and towns. It starts right here. Of course, it's my epicenter here. It's my home, right? It starts right here, and it goes along the South Hadley Amherst. Uh, I call it the bottom of the district, and we go up the Connecticut River to Vermont and New Hampshire, right to Royalston, left to Coleraine. So it tees out beautifully. I said earlier today that I think it's the most beautiful place in the nation. And I, you know, every day when I'm in the district, I, I can't believe what an exquisite place we live in, full of unbelievably visionary people. So when I think about the role of state government, especially now, and I will say right now I'm feeling the weight of the crisis at the national level, and I want to shout out to Rachel Maori, who I, uh, who I um, am proud to know from Move On. Um, and, you know, uh, when I was at Move On, I created this crisis response network that just got triggered, friends, because we have a crisis at the national level. So all my Move On colleagues and I were texting, so thank you for leading it here for us, Rachel. So I think state government right now in 2019 has to do two things, and we have to do it really well. We have to be a line of defense for the madness that's happening at the national level. And that means enacting things like the Safe Communities Act this session. It means fully funding education. Education this session. We cannot wait. It means the kinds of health care reforms. And I'm so proud to be a sponsor of Medicare for All. I'm also the co-chair of the caucus. We're starting a caucus for the full, first time to focus our study. So we, we have to be a line of defense. We must be, we must protect our state and our local communities, but we have to do something so much more than that. And I sometimes call it keep the lights on on democracy, but I really think right now it's keeping hope alive on big, bold issues like climate change, on real tax reform. It's essential because we will make it through this crisis, thanks to great organizing. We will make it through, and when we do, our nation is going to need the kinds of work that we should move through in the legislature so that we can go back to legislating at a national level the way we must do in Massachusetts. Uh, so I'm really, I'm thrilled about the committees that I was assigned to by the Senate president. They reflect the conversations I had about the priorities of our district. Right, so I did want to talk about revenue. Uh, if you sometimes uh, I'm writing this wonderful column, uh, or the Gazette's giving me a wonderful opportunity to write this Dear Joe column, I wrote about revenue because we got a great question. And I say that we're, right, right now we have is austerity budgeting, which is where we're told there's not enough money for the things that matter in our state, and that is not true. We've made policy decisions that has robbed the state of the, and the revenue necessary. Um, I'm being given the wrap up. So, so I want to talk about that as well, but also healthcare, education, environment, and I also want to talk about economic development. I want to talk about jobs and transportation, which is why I've filed some really good legislation for both of those. So more later. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Senator Comerford and Representative Sabadosa for their wonderful introductions, and thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is how it's gonna be run. Um, we're starting with uh, student questions. Uh, each of the student groups that helped us organize the event uh, will be asking a question. Um, Representative Sabadosa and Senator Comerford, please keep your answers short so we have time for audience questions. Um, and then after that, we will move on to audience questions and questions that were submitted ahead of time um, online. Um, we're moving around with index cards and pens. If the people moving around can wave their hands, they're around. Um, and you can write your name and your question on an index card and we'll collect it. Um, no name means your question won't be read, so please remember to put your name on there and write legibly. Um, uh, we have people screening in the back so that um, we only have appropriate questions and we try to keep repetition to a minimum. Um, so enough about the nitty gritty details. Um, our first question uh, from a youth group comes from Kaylee from the Young Democrats. Um, well, hello, as you already heard from today, my name is Kaylee, and I'm a freshman. No? no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what? Let me get out. Mic right there. There's there's mic. I think it's on? I think this is on, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so, as I said before, my name is Kaylee. It's not close enough? Okay. There you go. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, I am a freshman at... Uh, the school and so our question uh, well so during your campaigns you both spoke about um, the need for leadership in state legislatures as a result of increasing partisanship in the federal government um, what role if any do you think uh, this will play in the way <laughs> um, you legislate and what ways will you work to combat similar partisanship in the state government So the, there is a Democratic supermajority in both the House and the Senate. So partisanship in the House, I'll speak for the House and I'll let the Senator speak for the Senate. Um, Senate uh, partisanship in the House is actually a little bit more amongst the Democrats um, and where they fall on the political spectrum. Um, interestingly for myself, uh, we, so we've only had one formal session already, and that was about the rules debate. And I actually agreed with a lot of my Republican colleagues, because as far as I'm concerned, you vote based on the merit of a, of a particular amendment or bill or whatever it is, and it doesn't really matter who the person was that filed it. It matters if it's something that benefits your district. So, you know, I definitely consider myself to be very far to the left, and I find myself agreeing with Republicans on certain issues, and that's that's what that's going to look like, and I don't see working with them as an obstacle. In fact, um, they're really quite lovely and, uh, and add a lot to the conversation, add textures to the conversation that I don't think we would have otherwise. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, it's similar in the Senate, so we have a majority in the Senate. Uh, of Democrats, but I will say our Republican colleagues are there to work collaboratively. And when I was meeting with my Democratic colleagues getting ready to take office, you know, they made a point of saying, no, we, we try to join forces. And here's just one example. Um, uh, Natalie Blay, Rep. Blay from the 1st Franklin District and I, we wrote a piece of legislation and it said uh, during the shutdown, we asked the governor to call together a bipartisan working group of his administration, House members and Senate members because we knew that we had to address both the impact of the shutdown on communities like Northampton and local businesses but also on the people who were affected from those recipients of SNAP uh, to the shutdown workers, right, the federal workers and contractors. Uh, and so we called, you know, we called out the governor in a bipartisan piece of legislation. It was the first piece of legislation to pass the House. So uh, Rep. Lay, you know, kudos to Rep. Lay. She got it through the House, but it did trigger the Senate president to put together a bipartisan working group. So Rep. Lay was part of a bipartisan effort in the House. I was part of something in the Senate. We made recommendations to both chambers. We met with the governor, uh, and we saw all along our Republican colleagues really caring as much as we do 
uh, you know, and actually sometimes even more vocal than some Democrats for the kinds of things that we need to do, like increased food assistance funding to the low income home, home energy assistance program. The majority leader in the Senate called, stood with me, and asked for more money from the governor. So, I, you know, I, I feel great hope. It's not the kind of same divide that we see fractured at the national level. These are folks who are, you know, who are trying to do good work for the Commonwealth. And similarly to the House, there were amendments in this rules process that the Senate went through uh, where I actually was also voting for, for transparency uh, along with my Republican colleagues. Okay, uh, great. Uh, hi, my name is Willa Sippel, and I'm a junior here at Northampton High School and a co-leader of the Environmental Club. Um, so my question is, uh, so climate change will dispropor disproportionately and is disproportionately affecting many groups, including those in poverty who are often people of color. How will you account for this and your plans to work to limit climate change harm on people's lives in the future through legislature? Um, thank you for asking that. Of course, uh, you know, one of the things that I heard from this district was the demand that I work on your behalf on climate. Uh, so I'm really jazzed that I, that because I learned so much during the campaign, because I hired in a, a staff people who are so committed, I'm really proud of the legislation I filed uh, on climate. I actually saw Marty Nathan in the back and I said one of them is an homage to Marty's work and the, the pipeline work. It actually says to, um, it says basically essentially we can't have a new pipeline unless pipeline companies show that they've done everything that they can to get renewable energy in. Um, I also created something called a net zero stretch code uh, which would say, uh, it's really good, uh, which would say, uh, and again these are all ideas that I got from this community. That's the basis of legislation. That's how it should work. And what Rep. Sabadosa talked about, right, uh, the second part of that is us joining together to pass this legislation. Uh, so I created this uh, net zero stretch code, which basically says, we'll give you incentives if you create net zero buildings, meaning they can't use a drop of energy. They either have to be, they have to take renewable energy from the grid or produce energy, but they have to be locked tight, you know, and so a bunch of other pieces. Uh, and then I got, you know, appointed to one of my first committee choices, which is this climate change committee which will do an enormous bill on climate change. And I'm very excited, Senator Pacheco, we got to do that last time, uh, but we didn't get far enough. And so we get to take it far enough, we get to take it farther with net metering caps and renewable portfolio standards and all of the things that I know people in this community care a lot about. So you, your question talked about how do we do this and make sh making sure that we aren't impact negatively impacting low-income communities, which are often, unfortunately, people of color, especially in this state. Um, you know, Rep. Dubois has filed for many years now a piece of legislation about environmental justice. And that, to me, is the lens through which we need to look at all of our environmental legislation. We need to be really careful that we're not passing legislation that really helps upper middle class and, and wealthy people and sort of leaves the rest of the state in the dust. And we've, we've do that frequently, unfortunately. So I'm, I've been, I immediately co-sponsored. I went out to lunch with her and, and really went through that piece of legislation and immediately co-sponsored that because it felt like the right way to talk about the climate emergency. We also need to talk about the climate emergency, though, as a public health crisis. And I think that when we look at it that way, when we reframe it, it is, we are being much more careful about how we are impacting low-income people. Hi, um, my name is Zelia Maya, and I'm a senior at Northampton High School and the representative for the Feminist Collective. Um, our question is, in the wake of the Me Too movement, we believe lawmakers must step up and play a bigger role in promoting sexual health education. When and how should students in the Commonwealth be learning about consent and safe sexual practices? <laughs> Um, probably like around nine months is when that should start. 
I completely reject the notion that we should be talking about sex ed in high school and not before. It should be starting really early. Thank you. <laughs> and, and when I say that, I mean, it does, it needs to obviously be age appropriate. But the, we cannot wait until kids hit high school to talk about consent. Consent is something that you learn as a little person and having the ability to talk about what, you, what, you, what your body wants, how you want to be touched, if you want to be touched. Those are all things that need to be learned in nursery school. And we can't, we're not going to be successful in changing the culture around that unless we do just that. And there seems to be a level of terror in our society that we teach our kids anything about this. The city of Worcester right now is in the midst of a huge debate about whether sex ed should even be in their schools. So that's where we are. We're in a really backwards position. So I'm excited that you have a feminist club, quite honestly. <laughs> And you know, one of the pieces of legislation, and I talk about it a lot, that I've worked on for a long time is the Healthy Youth Act. I would love to see that pass. It's a bill that would require medically accurate, comprehensive, age-appropriate, LGBTQIA plus friendly sex ed in public schools. The parents... <laughs> that parents can opt out of, but it's an opt out and not opt in system. And that's step one. It is not the end of the discussion. And also, like, the Me Too movement has been picked up by the media, but the Me Too movement started with the dawn of time. Thank you, Zalia. Um, I, I caught your father's eye in the back, Vijay. So I've known Zalia, for, I don't know, for a very long time. And so it's like, it's, it's revolutionary to have you come and bring this question. So thank you. Um, uh, you know, I, I agree with much of what Rep. Sabadosa said. I, I believe we must teach our children about the autonomy that every child should have over their own body. Uh, and we have to teach it along a whole continuum of identity, gender identity, because, of course, we are not in a binary system. We have to, you know, just uh, let go of that on every level. Um, so I'm, you know, so I also, of course, have sponsored the Healthy Youth Act. It's a very good bill. Its time has come, and we have to move it on. And I, I want to just say that in addition to doing the kind of work, really being in solidarity with student-led movements, with educators, with school committees that want to do this, we have to, in the legislature, actually walk the walk. Right? We have to rid the state house of the kinds of sexual assault and abuse tolerance. Um, because it's, if we say one thing and do another, we're always undermining. Right, So we can say, yes, we value women's bodies. We value a right to choose. We value gender and sexual identity. We think sexual assault and abuse is is terrible, and yet in the, in the state house right now, if you are found responsible of sexual assault or abuse, the state actually could pay your fine for you or settle your claim, which is why I filed a bill to make that impossible, right? Because that it can't, we never should put state money. And that's one piece, right? This is all one piece of this much ma more massive uh, question that Zalia's, Zalia has brought to us. But I'm, you know, I'm committed to trying to figure out with my great colleagues the kind of new day that we have to embrace. So thank you. I could go on and on. Um, hello, my name is Riley Lerman. Um, I'm a junior at NHS and I am the representative for our school's GSA. Um, my question is, what can be done at a state level to make schools and workplaces more inclusive for LGBTQ plus students and adults? Well, you know, first of all, we have to fund our schools adequately. And that means funding all of the programs that I know our schools want to have. But we prevent them from having, right, because our, our state has not funded to the tune of $1 billion our public schools and to the tune of $500 million our public colleges and universities. So first, we have to pony up, really, as a state. Um, and then we need good legislation that's a wraparound piece of legislation. I'll tell you about a couple of bills that I have that I really like. Um, one is about gender neutral bathrooms, right, and making gender neutral bathrooms the norm. We don't have to, again, have this binary understanding of bathrooms. It's part of what makes a school place unsafe. 
And so we have to both pass that and then we have to fund it so that schools aren't left with an unfunded mandate. Mayor Narkowitz, I'm looking at you. Because <laughs> ma unfunded mandates put schools in a terrible position. Um, I also have a bill that actually the Senate President gave to me to pass, and we're going to pass it, you guys. We're going to do it together, which actually says that on all state documents, and that includes licenses, right? So when students are getting their license, there isn't a gender marker for male and female. There is an option, an option for people who don't want to identify. They want to identify as, as they don't want to identify as either male or female. They want to identify along the continuum, and that should translate also to birth certificates when people have a, when people want to identify differently, and it tra should translate to all school IDs. We should have this new idea just be part of the norm, right? This is how we're going to go forward. So. So one small thing to add to all of that. We also need to be able to look at our elected officials and find role models there. So if we want to pass legislation that is LGBTQIA plus friendly, we need to elect people who identify as that. We need to hire people who identify as that. We need to make sure that we're, we're not just um, you know, passing legislation to potentially be inclusive, we need to actually be inclusive. And I think that sometimes, you know, I know there's a caucus, but it's still small. Diversity, there, thank you. <laughs> and that's, yes, and that's, and that's the sad truth, right? I mean, to your question before even, we need to elect more women. We need to elect people, we need to elect diversity. <laughs> Every single election on all levels of government. And then we are gonna see good legislation pass because people are going to have a vested interest in making sure it passes. So that's the small addition. Hi, my name is Pearl Shred, and I am a sophomore at Northampton High School and I am a representative for Students of Color Alliance. Um, our question is how will you as our representatives support students of color going through our public school system? Well, I, I mean, I, I agree what we've already talked about, the funding piece of schools. Um, that's, you know, the first, the first component of all of this. Um, and again, that's going to lead back to the discussion about revenue that I hope we're going to have. But I don't know, I, th I think it's, it's similar to the last answer, that we need to make sure that we're actually hiring teachers of color. Um, are there teachers of color at Northampton High School? Two, three, three, okay. So, so we're seeing a similar, a similar pattern, both in the state house and in the schools. And I think that that's the first level of, of support that we need to offer. Thank you so much for this question. You know, when I was thinking about it just now, I thought part of it is creating spaces in schools, right, and supporting the school committees and the, you know, the school committees and the principals and the superintendents. We had a meeting this morning with superintendents talking about the way the delegation can and must come to the table as a strong advocate for school districts that are just under siege, right? Uh, so we have to do that. And then we have to create state laws that are fair to people of color, right? So we have to look at the continuum of laws. And this looks at health disparities, right? right? So I, 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 one of my colleagues created a bill a long time ago that he couldn't find anyone to, uh, to put in. Well, of, course, I, we know, of course, I could put it in. Um, it's, it's actually a health equity law that really demands that DPH and a number of the state agencies have to declare the health disparities, right? Have to work actively to chip away at what we understand to be groaning racial disparities across all healthcare delivery in the Commonwealth. We have to look at our other policies as well, right? The ways in which our state policies continue continue the marginalization of communities of color. And when we do that, as well as support the inside workings of schools, we'll start to create a, a commonwealth that is much more just across race, across class, across gender and sexual identity, or across all identities. And that's gonna be part of the puzzle that we have to do, those of us who are committed uh, to cr trying to create a much more equitable uh, commonwealth. Hi, 
Hi. Let's take care. My name is uh, Noah Freeman Cassis. Um, I'm a sophomore at Northampton High School and a representative for the uh, Northampton High School Student Union. Uh, and here's my question. Well, you guys have been talking about this actually for the last couple questions. So this touches on um, funding. So as students, uh, we've experienced firsthand the effect of underpaid teachers in overcrowded classrooms as our school district has been unable to meet rising demands. How will you fight to make sure NHS and all other public schools receive the full funding we need and deserve? Um, great letter in the Gazette. Um, so you remember this summer, we had something called the millionaire's tax, right? It was a ballot initiative. It was a good ballot initiative. And in fact, the majority of people in the, in the Commonwealth wanted it. The Supreme Judicial Court said that couldn't happen for reasons that are too weedy right now to go into, but that's okay. Because people in the legislature filed it. Senator Jason Lewis, who is a really good guy in the Senate, put it in and basically it would do a version of what the ballot question would do and actually it would raise three billion extra dollars by asking people who make a million dollars and above to pay a little bit of an extra tax. That's the kind of revenue reform that we need in the Commonwealth. And we also need to, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a real, I'm a deep budget nerd, right? So one of, the, I, I, I asked for ways and means. I didn't get ways and means, but I did get revenue. Uh, and the reason I got revenue was to have this conversation. So there I'll be able to fight for right at the table, the fair share amendment filed by my colleague. But I also filed a couple of revenue bills. I couldn't file them because the Senate doesn't file mo what's called money bills. Um, but I co-sponsored two good packages. One is a real estate, a luxury real estate transfer tax that would give cities like Northampton the opportunity to create a fund for affordable housing. Um, it's a very good, it's, re it's a really good bill. My colleague um, Liz Malia in the house uh, had it and I joined and then I also came onto a bundle of um, taxes, uh, things like corporate taxes, capital gains tax, really good, smart, um, just ways of looking at taxation. And they would bring in quite a lot of money. We're not going to pass all of them. We'll fight for all of them. But we will pass the millionaire's tax. I'm pretty sure of it. Uh, and we'll, I think we're going to pass a couple of those other tax measures. I know the Senate President is committed to it and has made revenue one of the priorities for this session. I'm psyched about it. So I'm going to match Senator Comerford's wonkiness. So my breakfast reading this morning was the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Institute's list of ways that we could generate revenue in the state of Massachusetts. And I will tell you, I did not read through all of it because I don't eat that much, but I got through page three and I was really frustrated because I had already managed to find $3 billion that the state has, was basically leaving on the table because we haven't really revamped our tax code. So our tax rate is going down. And while that's good for low-income and middle-income people, it's not great for the Commonwealth. If we returned our tax rate to 5.95 and added earned income credits and other tax incentives for middle-income and low-income people, that's a billion dollars right there. A billion dollars. Why aren't we doing that? And so I get frustrated because I'm reading these things that this institute has written that are good policy, but that we're not implementing. So the fair share amendment, absolutely. But also, let's keep going because we know that we need more than $2 billion. Because we need to invest in our schools and we need to invest in infrastructure. We need to invest in a lot of things. So revenue is indeed the first answer to that question. But there are two other things I want to mention. I'm going to mention Medicare for all. Because one of the greatest rising costs for your schools is health care. It's health insurance premiums. And I cannot tell you how much it frustrates me that we are talking about how do we get the state government to give schools more money that the schools can then give back to private insurance companies. That's corporate welfare. That shouldn't be happening. And the other thing I want to say is unions. We are moving away from strong unions and we need to move right back towards strong unions.
Unions are what make sure that we have a strong workforce and we need to be able to have our teachers negotiate and negotiate forcefully. So revenue, Medicare for all, unions. Hi, my name is Margot Shafikreen. I am a senior at NHS, um, and I am a representative of the Mayor's Youth Commission. Um, so both of you during your campaigns have endorsed lowering the municipal voting age to 16. Um, since then, the Mayor's Youth Commission has been advocating for a home rule petition that would lower the voting age locally, um, but we have faced the hurdle of gaining support in the state legislature. Um, how will you continue supporting the Vote 16 campaign and how will you work to continue promoting youth civic engagement overall? Can you just clarify you've had a hard time gaining support? Have you filed? I haven't received a home rule petition. <laughs> okay, well, but there has been a bill filed around reducing the municipal voting age in the legislature. I was just trying to make sure I didn't miss something. <laughs> Um, there has been legislation filed, and I am excited that I am now on the elections committee, so I can help to fight for those things. And you know, I think that yes, it is true that there are a lot of people who will argue that um, that 16-year-olds are not responsible enough, or that they are not informed enough. And I just plan on bringing all of you to the state house to argue against that. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, I am on the great bill, uh, which was filed in the Senate by actually Senate President Amer Merida Harriet Chandler, who means business. She wants to pass this bill. So there will be opportunities to come testify at hearings. That's part of what we do on your behalf is make sure that your voices and actually you are in the room influencing lawmakers to be able to pass bills that are really critical. I, I believe that the voting age should be lowered because I believe that, that young people, first of all, young people are the future. I know that sounds, that sounds tremendously trite as I say it, but I totally mean it, meaning that you're inheriting this planet, therefore you should have a say in it as soon as we possibly can manage because you have a vision of the future that I believe is bolder and brighter and bigger uh, than the one currently being carried forward. And so we need young voices in the mix. And, and we, need, we need you in the mix while you're in high school. And, and really having a direct effect, you know, directly connected with so many state policies that you should have the right to change through your vote, which is really the biggest thing that we get in this democracy. Uh, so I'm really excited about it, and it really is an open invitation. When that bill gets into committee, and it will, you know, we should have busloads of folks coming to the State House to raise your voices for this rule, for this law. Hi, my name is Julia Albro Fisher. I'm a freshman at Northampton High School and a representative of the Pioneer Valley Students for Gun Control. Yesterday marked the one year anniversary of the Stoneman Douglas shooting, which spurred us to get involved in the youth gun control movement. But since then, we've wondered whether any more statewide regulations could be fairly challenged under the Second Amendment. Do you think the gun control movement in Massachusetts has reached its limit, either politically or constitutionally, and what do you think are the next steps for the gun control movement in Massachusetts? So the answer is no, we have not reached our limit of what we can and must do around common sense gun legislation. We passed in the legislature uh, last session, we passed some good laws, like the red flag bill, which I supported. Uh, people asked me during the campaign, I think it's a good bill. And if you don't know it, basically it says that there, if, if a judge and or care providers believe that someone is a danger to themselves or others, and they have a firearm, they can actually take that firearm away now leg legally. And I think that's really important. But I'm on, I, I've co-sponsored a number of bills in this area, in, in, in large part, actually, because I know it's such an incredibly important issue. And during, actually, during the transition, um, where's Ben? Ben and a group of Smith students um, were talking, and Ben was taking class, Ben Mar Mars Horowitz. He was here somewhere. Oh, yeah. And, and they asked, they sort of grilled me on what more we could do. Um, and that was really helpful. So here's a couple of things. One is, uh, 
we can tax firearms and, and ammunition and create a fund for violence prevention. We can make sure, yeah, that's a bill. I'm on. We can make sure that every single gun sold in the Commonwealth is sold from a licensed dealer. And if you can believe it, that's not so currently. Um, and the second thing that we can do, or third thing, there's many more, but here's three. Um, we can make sure that no one is allowed to purchase a gun in Massachusetts more than one time a month. That will, uh, I know, I know that's, that's a low bar, friends. I know. But what... <laughs> But what that does, friends, is it prevents the warehousing of guns, right? It prevents someone stocking up to resell in an underground market, right? And so if they can't buy in bulk, it's going to be much, much harder. There are more, there are more rules than that. What's true is that Massachusetts has some really good gun laws. I want to shout out to Maura Healy, who is a really kicking AG. Um, so... So there are fine-tuning things that we can and must do. There's more, the more technical ones, like there's some ID stuff where you can actually imprint your, to make the uh, trigger more safe, and there's a bunch of those bills that I'm on. Uh, but anyway, we can and do more, and we should. Yeah. I'm not sure there's mu too much more to add to that, but I, I would encourage you, keep, keep advocating, like keep up the fight, because you inspired me a year ago with your activism and just walking out of school and, and standing up for things that you believed in, so please keep that up. And yes, lots of good state level bills, but I would also start to look at the federal because that is where the real fight is going to have to be if we're really going to end gun violence and, and mass shootings. And I just wanna say there's a lot of confusion in the media about how this is about mental health. This is about guns. So let's keep our focus. I'm Larkin Christie. Um, I would be a senior, but I haven't gone to school for like five years, so. <laughs> Um, Massachusetts was built and continues to exist on institutional racism. We believe it is an obligation of citizens and politicians to work to undo these cycles of oppression. Paying monetary reparations is an important way to begin compensating for hundreds of years of theft of black land, lives, and money. What steps do you plan, to impl plan on taking to implement reparations on a governmental level? Oh, and I'm representing you thrice together. Sorry, I forgot to say that. <laughs> So black and native, right? Native. Thank you. So I don't, I don't know if there's a reparations bill in Massachusetts. It would be an interesting piece to, to file. Um, I will tell you about the bill that I did file, um, which is small, and it's a, it's a first step. But I filed a bill around the state seal and logo um, because it's racist and it needs to change. And this is a piece of legislation that Representative Byron Rushing filed for like maybe 20 years, and nobody really paid any attention. And then I filed it, and people got really angry. <laughs> um, so that's been, been interesting, to actually have these conversations. And I have, I cannot tell you out of all the pieces of legislation I have filed, I received more pushback about that one single piece. Because when you say, when you call out racism in the Commonwealth, how do people get upset? Um, so that's my small part and how I'm going to start this fight to push back. And just seeing how much vitriol that's created, it's going to be a real fight. But I am interested in a reparations bill. It's a really good question. Uh, I will build on what Rep. Sabadosa just said. I, I'm a sponsor of the Senate bill uh, to change the state seal, which if, if you haven't looked at it, um, I, you know, go, go home or pull it up on your phone at some point and look at it. It is horrific that we in Massachusetts have this as our state seal. Um, there's another bill, though, that I also introduced. Uh, again, this doesn't get directly at your question, which I think is a good one, and I'm going to have to give it more thought uh, and actually look to see how I can be a better ally. But I also introduced a, a bill um, with colleagues about actually um, asking communities that use native symbols, native languages, native uh, names to actually, as mascots, to actually step back from that. 
uh, and transform their relationship. And, and it gets to this sort of underpinning that we have in the Commonwealth where we, we ask, we point fingers at the South um, readily here and look at you know, Civil War statues that shouldn't be. And yet our own state seal is, is an abomination. And we hear, especially in the western part of the state, where there was a very significant native presence, we take native names and cultures as mascots for our sports teams. And there's just a, a bunch of research. This actually came from Northampton, a group in Northampton um, of native and allied um, leaders saying this is just super painful and it's part of the kind of quiet way that racism is insidious. Uh, and so there's a bunch of work to be done in the Commonwealth on both, both of those things and the question you asked. So we're gonna call up uh, three questions at a time. We're gonna alternate between the questions that were submitted ahead of time and those just submitted right now. Um, so can uh, Vicki Elson, um, Jordy Windsor, and Jeremy Whalen, Jeremy, are you here? Because if not, I'll read your question for you. <laughs> I'm going to read any questions of people who aren't here, just for the record. So, All right. Hi, I'm Vicki Elson with NuclearBand.us, and the two of you have both helped already to rid the world of nuclear weapons once and for all. Thank you. Um, you have both put bills into the state uh, government about creating a citizen's commission to explore what it would look like for the state of Massachusetts to disconnect from the nuclear weapons industry by uh, divesting its funds and disconnecting from those companies in terms of contracts. Um, so my question is, uh, what else do you think that we should be doing as citizens? We want to hurry up and finish this problem so we can get on to all the other ones that are so important. Uh, this one seems like a no-brainer. So um, what, do you, what else would you recommend that we do? Well, you know, so this, this is actually to get to the first point um, that Sherilyn asked about, the role of state government. Part of the role of state government is to push up to our federal colleagues. So the, the bill that Vicky is talking about, we did, we introduced it, Lindsay and I, um, and it's a good bill, uh, and we should talk about that at the state level. Nuclear weapons spending, however, is a federal issue. So all of us must uh, push up to our, our federal delegation and ask them to take action in our name as well, right? That's gonna be the kind of ground up, the bottom up. It can come through the state and we should do it at the state level and talk about the impact of nuclear weapon spending and the danger of nuclear, the, the nuclear arsenal that our country currently maintains and the impact on our communities, both budgetarily and our, actually just our physical safety. Yes, we should talk about that at the state level and we must demand from our federal government an entire sea change on Pentagon spending, on war spending, on nuclear weapons spending. That is the kind of, right, that's the kind of work. And, and as lawmakers operating in your name, I can actually do, you know, of different kinds of organizing than I used to do when I was an organizer for the American Friends Service Committee doing this or, or move on, which is I can say, these are my constituents and nuclear, a, a, a nuclear kind of proliferation that we have in this nation harm, could harm them. It harms them now, just the threat of it. It harms them now because we have no money for things like education, because we put it all to the Pentagon and nuclear weapons and war. Uh, and we need more from you, friends, in terms of disarmament. So that's another thing that we can do. I think the very first thing that we are going to need to do, though, is pass these wonderful bills on the state level, and that's going to require a great deal of advocacy. I'm not sure about the senator, but I don't know how much traction this bill is really getting in the House right now. So I think, while I'm excited that my constituents reach out all the time, I'm not sure that other people are hearing that. And so that's step number one, to activate your networks across the Commonwealth and make sure that people are really getting to their legislators and saying this matters. Because our message to the federal government is so much more powerful if these things can pass on the state level. That's really going to, to mean something, I think. So, you know, there, there, I know that in Boston there's some, some activism around this, but it's going to need to spread right across the state. So Jeremy's question, since he's not here. Um, 
So last year, the Northampton Human Rights Commission asked Northampton residents and elected officials to commit to treating each other with d dignity and civility as a basic tenet of our community. Can you commit to this pledge? And if so, how do you intend to demonstrate the spirit of this pledge when representing Western Mass on Beacon Hill? I need to read this. Because civility is great. Being polite to each other is nice. Sometimes we need to be a little bit fierce to get things done, though, in the State House. So we can make friends, we can work in coalition, but we also are going to, we're going to really need to stand up and, and say things that are hard and take votes that are hard and push. So I, I would rather see what is written there before I commit to being civil, if civil is just a way of telling me to sit down and be quiet, because I'm not going to do that. Well, ditto. Um, so, uh, so, you know, what I like about that uh, is that it's, uh, I think respect, respect is speaking the truth. Respect is actually saying to someone's face your opinion or your idea, but saying it in a way that recognizes that that person's a human being with whom you may really disagree. Um, and so we have to still speak the truth and speak to that person in a way that defends and upholds the values of this community. So, you know, I can commit, uh, not having read the pledge, I can commit to respect. Um, but, you know, I think respect is, again, this, the kind of full measure of being the most fierce advocate for you all I can be when faced with someone who perhaps doesn't share our values here, um, but who is going to have to hear from me why I uh, respectfully disagree. <laughs> So uh, the next three questions, um, I'm sorry if I say your name wrong. Um, Jonathan Daub, are you here? Awesome. Um, and then um, uh, Josie Alderman, is that? Yeah. Um, and um, uh, Josiah um, Borikius, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Awesome. You were, right. you were pretty awesome. close. You were pretty close. Right. I'm Jonathan Derby. Two-part question. What do you see as your obligation to the local community colleges? And any thoughts about Hampshire College at this point? Um, so in terms of community colleges, uh, I have GCC in my district. Uh, one of the reasons I filed the Cherish Act uh, is because I believe that community colleges and public higher education institutions are absolutely vital. Uh, I believe that we should grow our uh, Commonwealth's commitment to community colleges, especially at a moment where higher ed is becoming so unaffordable, and especially when we know that many, many, many uh, students who are currently low income come from um, immigrant communities disproportionately choose community college as the runway in. I want to increase that runway and make it bigger and better funded. Uh, and just as a side note, uh, Eve, the, um, President Solomon Fernandez in GCC is just lighting up the world with her vision for the college and I think we all should just be, you know, just dancing in the aisles because of that. Um, in terms of Hampshire, uh, Rep, uh, Mindy Dom and I share Amherst. Uh, I have been fairly engaged in Hampshire, uh, both uh, with the faculty and staff and community members and nonprofits that sit on Hampshire's campus, trying to understand the impact and be an advocate for them to Hampshire. I've uh, met with the Attorney General, I met with the Commissioner of Higher Education just yesterday, because what keeps getting talked about is this state regulatory environment. Um, and so I want to understand that state regulatory environment, and I want to make sure that nothing that's happening in Hampshire isn't being felt as a fait accompli, that Hampshire's not feeling that anything that's happening at the state level is a fait accompli and forcing a decision. So Rep. Dom and I have had many conversations. Um, 
with our allies I've, uh, at the state level, the with the attorney general, I met with the commissioner the of higher education, education just and yesterday. Board member, because what uh, keeps getting you know, talked I'm about stay is engaged the state regulatory uh, to make sure environment. That anything that I can possibly um, and so do I want to understand state level, state regulatory as an advocate and I want to make sure that I am nothing doing that's happening in Hampshire isn't being felt as a fait accompli. That Hampshire is not feeling that anything that's happening at the state level is a fait accompli and forcing so a decision. So Hampshire is not. So Rep. Dom and I have had um, many so conversations. Be backing up anything with that's our allies at the state the level, the with the general, I said, with the commissioner of higher education just yesterday. So the college itself is not in my district. I'm going to stay in state regulatory environment. Anything that I can possibly do on a state level, state regulatory environment. As an advocate, I want to make sure that nothing that's happening in Hampshire and I'm worried with them, and I don't know what the path forward is, and I still feel like I'm a little bit in the dark about what's happening there, and I think a lot of us feel that way. Um, so it really, my goal is to, is to back up whatever we can do, um, because even though it is not my district, those people are. And it's part of our community. Even, you know, across the river, it makes, it, it adds something. I was driving past the sign to Hampshire today, and I just thought, if Hampshire College isn't here, what does that mean for this valley? Um, so I guess I'm with you, and I will do whatever, whatever we can. I'm sorry. Um, so community college or public higher education institutes, institutions, and even if, again, I don't have any in my district, my commitment is to public education. Hi. Um, I'm Josie Alderman, Joanne Alderman, and I'm from Southampton. Uh, recognizing that Medicare for all is a very nice concept, but Medicare does not cover all medical expenses mm -hmm. and costs. There is much that Medicare does not cover, and many, most seniors, and I'm one, mm -hmm. um, need a supplemental yep. insurance plan to cover many expenses, including health <laughs> co-pays and prescription costs, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, please describe your vision for health care for all and how you will um, get it implemented. So, you know, Medicare for All in a way is a misnomer because we're not actually talking about expanding the current Medicare system. I know that there's some conversations on the federal level about, about actually expanding it, but that's not the intent on the state level. The intent on the state level is to create a universal accessible single payer system. So, different. <laughs> And I hear you about the coverage, and I hear providers when they talk about reimbursement rates with Medicare. Those are all things that we need to address on the state for state-level legislation. So what I see, what the what the bill looks like right now is, it is a tax that replaces your insurance premiums. So it would go through a health care trust that would then pay your health care costs. Now, how do we implement that? We implement it slowly, not. 20 years from now slowly, but slowly, steadily, and methodically so that we are bringing in all of the stakeholders and all of the people who really need to have a say in what this looks like. So providers, economists, uh, nurses, people who are actually doing this work and understand what our healthcare system currently looks like, and people like you who get up and say, hey, I have a problem with my healthcare. This is something that the new system will need to address. So we're doing that work with groups like MassCare, and through the Medicare for All Caucus, I am the co-chair in the House, so it's uh, myself, Representative Tammy Govea from Acton, Joe Cumberford in the Senate side, and Senator Eldridge. So we're really working to put together a team of people that can collaborate with outside groups so that we write smart legislation. Now, that said, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the federal bill looks like when it comes out because it's different and new. And it actually has a, it, it, what I'm hearing is that it has a plan for how, what that transition looks like. And I don't know if it'll be federal or state level first or what that will be, but I think that we can learn from each other as we move through this process. So I, you know, when I talk to people about Medicare for All, I say, I'm so excited to be filing this bill, but I don't think it's going to pass in two years. I think that these two years are about building the structure and gaining the intelligence and the information that we need so that we can do this wisely, so that we don't create something that doesn't work. What we know, 
Thank you. What we know is that our current system isn't working, that our current system is broken. So we have to fix it. We have to make this change. Um, I think what you said was beautifully articulated in terms of both the, the charge ahead of us, in terms of creating good legislation that has uh, both the expertise that we need in the room, the stakeholders in the room, and then the broad people's movement, which is what it's going to take, right? That plus some, plus some folks inside the state house. That's the, that's the, actually the magical uh, calculation that we're going to need for Medicare for all. But one thing I'll just add, a small thing I'll add is that one of the other pieces that I, I know that we're both thinking about is we have to also begin having conversations about what we already pay for health care. Uh, and the, the actually the impact of the kind of costs that we pay that we don't even think that we're paying for health care on our city budget, on our school budgets, on our personal family budgets. So that's part of this too uh, that, that uh, Rep. Sabadosa was talking about creating the roadmap is really a public conversation about the hidden cost of health care and its impact on all of us uh, and the kind of... Um, the kind of ways in which, even though we are very proud in Massachusetts for the coverage that we have, the truth-telling that we need to have in terms of uh, many people who cannot afford um, the quality coverage that is available to some and pay really high premiums, really high co-pays, and still in our Commonwealth have to make unbelievably barbarous choices between heating their homes or feeding themselves and their health care bills or prescription drug prices, which is all part of the kind of co public conversation that we must have in these new tech, two, in this next two years to get ready for the kind of transformative process that we have to have as a commonwealth. There really isn't any choice, I think, friends, right? Healthcare costs are about 42%, 42% of our state budget. They're not getting any lower. So if we want any more money for our cities and towns, for infrastructure, for education, for our elders, for our veterans, the things that we care about deeply, we must transform our health care system. I am Josiah Barishas with Massachusetts Forest Rescue. Given the scientific consensus that protecting standing forests is crucial to preventing climate change, and the current rapid rate of logging in Massachusetts state forests, and the millions of dollars in state grants currently subsidizing biomass power and heat and related logging, which create massive carbon emissions and are opposed by the American Lung Association due to their health effects, what are you doing to protect state forests and citizens as well as help us to shift to true green energy? Thank you. Um, I get email from you. It's so fun when, um, when, we, when we see people who come up to the mic. Thank you for that question. And actually, one of the things that happened today is that we had a legislative listening session in Sunderland. And we had two different groups at the table. We had uh, climate, we had three groups, but very relevant too. We had Climate Action Now. Anybody from Climate Action Now here? Okay, so we had Climate Action Now, and then we had another group that was actually talking about uh, what they called forest management. Um, and first, before I do anything else, there is a Climate Action Now event in Northampton on the 26th, 20, 25th at Lyman Hall. Yep. Yep. Okay. 6.45 on the 25th is a meeting. The next night at Congregation B'nai Israel, Climate Action Now has brought some of the best thinkers in the Commonwealth. I'm coming home early from Boston to go because there's, there are people who are actually going to have this very, very hard conversation uh, that we must have. We must understand the science between how uh, the, the science of maintaining our forests in the most healthy way to ensure that our trees, which I believe are breathing for us, right? Uh, they're breathing for us. They, they are as healthy as possible. And so there are facts. This must be a fact-based conversation. Um, so I am, I am doing the best I can to learn as quickly as I can, uh, and which is why I'm really grateful to Climate Action Now for putting on this kind of public conversation. 
uh, with some of the best people in the Commonwealth on the 26th at Congregation B'nai Israel. Um, I have signed on to a number of good bills, including one uh, that actually says in state forests, different than privately owned land, in state forests there may not be any logging unless the tree is actually shown to be diseased and must come down for the health of the forest. Um, that's, a, that's actually, uh, my colleague Susanna Whips in the House wrote that bill, and it's really an homage to people up in Franklin County that have really been trying to have this conversation. And there are a number of other bills that really look at carbon sequestration in trees, in the ground. I have a healthy soils bill that looks at uh, the way in which it's a great bill. Um, we have to maintain our soils and support our farmers and lower no-till soil uh, cultivation, both for their yields, which will get better, but the ground, the water, our trees, it's, they're all breathing for us, and we must come to their aid. So I've likewise signed on to the many pieces of legislation you have emailed me about to protect our forests. And I am not a proponent of biomass, but the, the piece, you, you also asked about how do we move towards green energy. And so I think the Gazette talked beautifully the other day about the carbon tax bill. Um, and the carbon tax bill is something that I believe in that Rep Benson has filed again this year and has over 100 co-sponsors, which is very exciting. Um, because in the House, that means a lot of people, a lot of people being in favor of something is very important. So the carbon tax would, would basically make fossil fuels more expensive and help us move towards actual 100% green energy. So I think that that's, that's a bill I'm going to be putting a lot of energy on. It is not my piece of legislation, but when I was co-sponsoring, I tried to be very judicious and only sign my name to things that I could really fight for. And that bill is one that I'm going to be fighting for. I'm, I'm also on that bill. It's Jen Benson's bill. It's an incredibly good bill. But actually to uh, Rep. Sabados's point before about good policy generating money, a carbon tax would tax $20 billion import of fossil fuel, which we import into the Commonwealth every year, and then divert it. It bifurcates it, and there's an environmental justice component, because communities that cannot bear the cost of a carbon tax will get that money, and then we'll bank some of it for the kind of green infrastructure that we need in public transportation and things like that. So it's a terrific bill. It's a moneymaker through good policy. All right, the next three questions will be from uh, April West. Um, Letitia, and uh, did you submit a question? Yeah. Um, and uh, Norma Roche. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Leticia. I know you just talked about healthcare, but what's what's the next step for like me Medicaid? I know you guys mentioned this, but what is it going to be a long term for people who have lower like healthcare stuff? I I wish they didn't mention this earlier, but. Um, so, so uh, around healthcare. So obviously, you know, we've we've talked about Medicare for all, and I think that's the direction that that we would both like to move in. I'm just going to talk about um, two pieces of legislation that I also filed around healthcare. I filed several, but um, one is around pharmaceutical drug pricing. Um, I think that that is a next big step that we need to um, to take, and I know that there's a lot of momentum around that. There are several good bills that have been filed this session. And then the other piece is getting at high deductible plans, and how do we make sure that people who have high deductible plans are still able to visit their primary care physicians, particularly if they have chronic illnesses. So I filed a bill that would create a carve-out so that people can actually see their physician instead of ending up in the emergency room, which is something that we're seeing far too frequently right now. And that bill was actually brought to me by area physicians. So I, I feel pretty good about filing it. They said, this is never going to pass, but can we please have this conversation? And so that's what I'm here for, to make sure that the things you want to discuss are actually discussed in the House. Um, 
Thank you for asking this question. I, I have a, a, a bill I'll talk about, which is actually um, also came from constituents. And it says that if you're receiving mental health treatment uh, from a provider, that you can't be dropped from that provider's coverage if your insurance changes. Uh, so that provider actually would get some state money to be able to cover you for six months um, until you could actually either transition to another provider or until the provider could make other arrangements with you. But what's happening in the Commonwealth is that there's episodic, because the, it's, it's such a profit-driven market with, in, with um, insurance provision that people's insurance changes rapidly. They can, and then with behavioral health, you form a relationship with a therapist. Uh, and so the people are really actually suffering greatly from, you know, they'll get with someone and then six months later they'll have to change insurance and they won't be able to see this person anymore. And so this is actually um, a bill that I'm excited about. And it would say to, you know, it would say to providers, we will get you if you stay with this client. And it'll say to the people who are entering into behavioral health care, just because your insurance changes, you're still going to have a window with the provider with whom you've been working um, to be able to have that kind of transition that you deserve. Hi, April West, Southampton. Um, this is kind of a personal uh, salary question and something that I think we as citizens and taxpayers need to be more aware of. You were both hired, we're paying a salary, but from what I understand, it doesn't fund all of your transportation costs to Boston. It doesn't fund uh, enough help assistance aid, and it doesn't fund local offices. So can you tell us and educate us and let us know how we can help help you do a better job for us and do the work. Thank you. I, I wasn't laughing at you. I was really laughing because this is one of those things where, and actually my colleagues are here, you know, so, you know, probably like Lindsay, I spent a lot of time thinking about the policy and what committees I wanted to be on and what caucuses. I never thought for a moment about thinking, well, what would be the money that we would get to actually do the business of the people of this district? Well, it turns out, um, it turns out that it's, it, we get a stipend. So we get a stipend, it's $20,000 about, um, we get the same one, we get a little bit more because we're out west. Um, then our colleagues out e in the eastern part, they get 15000 But that actually, it turns out, is all, all we get. Um, so if, you're, if we're from western Massachusetts or in a district which is hundreds and hundreds of miles, um, basically that doesn't actually even cover the mileage costs in a, in a year. Um, and certainly it doesn't cover the constituent management program or the website or the business cards, which we actually we have to pay for in the stationery, um, and all of the business of running an office. It doesn't cover it. It doesn't cover any of that. It's sort of, it's like a head scratcher, I will tell you. Uh, and, you know, should we have the privilege of serving um, another term, you know, you, I bet you Rep. Sabados would feel the same, but, you know, I think we should have this conversation because it's an equity issue. It's a regional equity issue because our costs here are so much greater than the costs in Boston, and yet we are not compensated to do the people's business. Um, here, the way that our colleagues in the East are compensated. Uh, and it's, again, it's not coming into our pockets, it's going into our pockets and then out again um, to do the work of the Commonwealth. Um, so so in, the, in the House, I'm just going to talk about our staffing for a minute because it's different. And I'm very jealous of Senator Comerford's staff because she has five staff people, and in the House we get one. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's true that our district is smaller, but I will tell you, um, it is a it is a constant struggle just to do the the basic things um, that that we need to do. And so, Laura, my legislative aide, is right here, in the front row. <laughs> um, she also has handouts with all my legislation and office hours and contact information. So if you haven't grabbed one from her, grab it. I'll put that pitch in now, but. A lot of times, 
we find that I am, when we are in the state house, I am running like a crazy person from meeting to meeting to meeting. And I literally mean running and I do run in heels. And Laura is at the desk just answering constituent calls and questions. And we love to hear from you, so keep doing that. This is not to say we want to hear from anyone less. We want to hear from you. But the constituent caseload can be very heavy. And we get an enormous amount of calls from people who have lost their health insurance, from people who are worried about their housing situations, from people who are trying to navigate government agencies and need her help. And we want you to call us. We want to advocate for you because I am so passionate about making sure that people don't lose health care or that they feel that they people need to feel safe in their communities and we are here to help and that is an enormous privilege but it is incredibly hard with one staff person because I'm running, she's answering emails, and then there are seven million other things that we need to do. Now, we've been fortunate that we've managed to um, find some interns, but I believe strongly that interns need to be paid. So that makes it... <laughs> It makes it a little more complicated. Luckily, we were able to get in. Um, Mount Holyoke has a program where they provide you with an intern and they pay that person. So we feel good about that. But even then, it's really difficult. And it is absolutely true that I spend, I think I've already spent my whole $20,000 stipend, even though I haven't received it, just on travel. Because the days that I am in district, it is back and forth across the district. and then of course back and forth to Boston three times a week. So I will say I'm very conflicted about this. I would love to have another staff person rather than more money because I honestly am so concerned that we live in a state with enormous income inequality and there are people who are struggling that I don't necessarily feel like I want the state to pay me more. I want everybody to do better before I get paid more. So that's my personal conflict. But in terms of who can run for office based on the salary, it's people who are willing to sacrifice or people who you know, have a spouse which, or people who are independently wealthy. Um, there's no real way to do this without some of those components at play and that limits who runs for office. So that's the other part of this that is a real problem because the voices that you want in government, you're not gonna necessarily get for the way that we're compensated to do this job. Um, so how can you help? Connect us with interns that through, through programs where they actually get paid, um, volunteer, um, any, anything, anything really, really helps because we wanna do the best job that we can for you. That's what we were elected to do, but the state doesn't make it easy. Hi, um, this is maybe a small piece of the revenue question, but I've been reading in the paper about the Amazon and New York story, and um, I wondered whether our state has a law allowing us to claw back incentives given to businesses to move here if they don't fulfill their promises about jobs or whatever they said they would do, and if not, do you feel that we could get one? Well, we are getting some money back because this just happened with GE in Boston where they were supposed to come in and then now they're not and the number of jobs is... So they are refunding the state some money, but I do think you bring up a really good point. We need to end corporate welfare. We know that this is this is not working. That uh, a lot of times, even when we see these companies that actually do come in and do open up, the number of jobs they promise are hardly ever as great as they say they are to begin with, and then they're not well paid, and then the next thing you know, that there there are layoffs. So we shouldn't companies should be moving here because this is a great place to live and work. It shouldn't be because we're giving them tax breaks. Um, building on that. Uh, my colleague Eric Lesser in the Senate actually just filed a bill around GE, so it's a late file, and it's saying, okay, GE, your money's coming back in um, to the Commonwealth. Let's give it to Voc Ed uh, for real job training and workforce development, since your jobs are not coming here. Um, I'm excited about that, and I think that's the kind of scrappy legislation that it's going to take. The Senate and House also passed a bill last year that's going to really mandate more and more corporate tax review which is a very good thing. And so we're just going to have to be vigilant all the way along, looking at each of these kind of what are called corporate tax expenditures uh, and really seeing who they're serving. Are they serving the people of the Commonwealth? 
or are they serving some other interest? And then we have to look at the, the costs of that interest. Um, and, but I want to just take a second because I didn't shout out to Elena Cohen and <laughs> Sam Hopper who were here. Um, Elena and uh, who were on my team and I should have. Um, and we also have uh, handouts in the back of actually how we can help. Um, uh, Sam and Elena put together a sheet of all the things that we should do on your behalf, whether at the municipal level or at the local personal level. Uh, and we're here to help and uh, Sam and Elena are doing unbelievable casework. Uh, and it is a crush between casework and policy work and other kinds of things, but it's actually what we're supposed to do. So please keep calling. So I think we're going to do uh, two more questions and then finish up. Uh, so Marty Nathan, she left. she left. Oh, that's so sad. I'll read her question. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, Ben Moss Horowitz. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Marty's question is addressed specifically to Lindsay. And she said, Lindsay, how can we bring democracy to the mass House of Representatives? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I, I talked a little bit about it before, but we need to bring transparency into our government. And we we need to do that, you know, we attempted to do that through rules change. And if you read my Gazette piece today, I talked a little bit about how I gave my first speech on the House floor um, around an amendment that failed, but it would have done three things. So in committees right now, um, committee votes are not public. Legislators do not have 24 hours to read the final version of a bill. And you have to imagine that sometimes those bills look nothing like they did when they came in. They're, they can be changed completely. So 24 hours is not a lot of time. And um, it would have given the public and all legislators access to, uh, to testimony and any documents that were provided to the committee around that legislation. Now, that's powerful, and so some committees do do these things, but a lot of committees don't. And having access to that information would be really powerful because it would tell you why, when you go in to testify before a committee and you hear nothing but positive comments and all the legislators are saying that they support it, why your bill is then sent to study. And it would tell you who is in that committee lobbying after that hearing, who has the chair's ear, and what's really going on. So now, of course, this amendment did not pass, but it felt, felt really important to get up and to say, my constituents are telling me that this process is murky. They don't understand what's happening. They don't understand why the word study actually means bill death. And they want to be involved. They want to be able to advocate. And how can we do that? And that felt to me like a small change that we could make. This is something that happens on the Fed. We're not asking for crazy things. This is something that happens on the federal level. I brought all of these. I don't think they look as many, but this is just a sample of the mail I got today from constituents. So this is like what I can bring to the House floor, and that's what I did in my speech. So how do we bring transparency? You guys are going to have to keep asking for it. Um, because the public response after the rules debate has been amazing. People are talking about it. Pe we don't usually talk about what happens in committees. So I think that's really the answer. And my commitment to you, obviously, is to be as open and transparent as possible. Because even if we don't take votes that are recorded, and I'm going to work real hard to make sure we take a lot of recorded votes, but even if we don't, I'm going to tell you how I voted. I'm going to tell you what happens in committees. And I need you to reach out to your representatives if I'm not that person and ask them to do the same, because we should all be doing that. We shouldn't be working in darkness. This was really to Lindsay, so I'll just say I've also made a public pledge to um, put out every single vote that I take, right? I'm going to put it out on a website, on social media, because you should know every single vote I take in your name if I'm representing you. Uh, and the Senate also passed. So different than the House, the Senate passed some good rules. So there is, you know, when, when we can get there together, uh, there will be two chambers. So the Senate passed a rule that I'm particularly in favor of, which is actually in every committee, uh, no vote is hidden from the public. 
right? So every single committee, which is often where bills, bills end up, right? So we see some public hearings and things, and we see some things, some votes taken on the floor, but it's in the committee process behind closed doors um, during deliberations where, and the voting, where we lose our constituents' faith. Uh, and I believe that that's a crime, right? We should have an open and transparent process. So I'm excited to, to keep pushing that forward. Hi, um, so I'm Ben. Um, I'm a senior at Northampton High School. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so currently, Massachusetts uh, is a right to shelter state, but the eligibility requirements for um, emergency housing are extremely limiting for those without children uh, under the age of 21. Um, so for this reason, um, the Massachusetts High School Democrats, which I'm the advocacy director of, has um, been working with the Massachusetts Coalition for the Homeless. So my question for you is, um, how do you intend on fighting for the roughly 17,000 um, uh, people in Massachusetts that are expected to experience homelessness during the next year? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, so. One, uh, we are resourced here by an incredible network to end homelessness uh, run by Pamela Schwartz, who is a living force of nature. <laughs> I don't know whether she's here. Uh, she may be here. Uh, but that is an incredibly uh, important people's force, Ben, that you know, we talk about this inside-outside partnership. Um, that group, some of you are here, are providers and policy experts who are pushing us to create more emergency beds uh, a pipeline of affordable housing, which would include SRO beds, but not stay there, right? Go to go to that single room occupancy. Would also go to you know affordable one and two bedrooms, affordable home buyer programs, you know, so that we can actually support people as they come out of a position of homelessness into decent and good housing. Um, so so it's a great inside outside partnership that you've already set us up to have. Um, and then part of what we have to do besides in addition to creating good policy with the help of this outside force and the expertise that we have in this region, is we have to get the money for housing. Um, and so the, what we hear is that the governor, bless his heart, wants to do sorry, wants to do housing. So we're going to have to push for housing, like a real bond bill, not one that actually is just full of fake money, which is often what bond bills are, but a real bond bill for, with real promises to deliver that money to communities that want to build that housing and or develop that housing. But then we have to actually have to also show the governor that we're going to raise some funds. And I just want to go back to that real estate transfer tax that I'm really excited about and say that what this tax would do is if a home is selling at 300% median, so 300% above median, it would take a small percentage of that and give it to cities and towns that just don't have enough money to create affordable housing stock and give them the ability to raise those funds. And it has provisions for elders and it has provisions for natural land. So natural land transfer isn't, um, isn't hi uh, hindered. And it has other provisions so that people are sheltered from not having un unrelated consequences. So because Senator Comerford talked about the housing piece, I want to go a little bit in another direction, which I know seems odd when we're talking about homelessness. But I had a really wonderful meeting with Friends of the Children recently, and they were talking about a program that they're working on to prevent homelessness and to really help support youth, particularly youth aging out of DCF, around mentorship. And they're creating these little hubs of mentors for young people. So each person gets six or seven people in their community that help them with different things, to learn life skills, to find jobs. Because we know that it's not j it's, it's finding housing, but it's also finding stability to maintain that housing and to be able to, con to, to afford it eventually and to figure out where you're going to go in, in your life. And that sometimes is really hard because we know that the youth who the homeless don't always have a family support network, and sometimes there are other issues at play, whether it could be mental illness, it could be substance use, but whatever that is, there is a need for a network. And I am so in love with that model that they're creating that I just really wish it was something that we could take statewide. And I realize that this is a bit of a pipe dream because, again, funding. But that 
I think is what we're gonna actually need to solve this problem. And I am grateful for this community because I think we do that well here. We do circles of care, we, we sort of rally around people, but we can do it better and we need to do it around youth who are, are at risk of becoming homeless. And I'm just, I think that that model is where we need to go. All right, well, thank you for answering all of those wonderful questions. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I urge you all to go and check out all of the wonderful tables outside. They touch on a lot of the topics we covered. And you can find out a lot of ways to get involved in these issues. And if you are a student who helped organize this or volunteered, if you want to come up, I want to get a photo. Uh, but thank you all for coming, and have a great evening. Thank you.